Can you hear the sound now? Okay, so please indicate if my sound is better for me in the chat box. Those of you who are having problem with the sound. Let's make sure we are on the same page. Is the sound okay now? Can you hear me, Ebenezer, Atta, um, uh, Phil, uh, Priscilla, Adoma, Ado, Uche, Ijehu, uh, no, Fariza, can you hear the sound now? Is it okay? Indicate in the chat box, let me know about that. Okay, Ebenezer Atta said it's okay now. Thank you very much. All right. So let's see what we're gonna do. Then let's continue with our discussion. So if you have any questions, it's gone again. <laughs> Ebenezer, it's gone again. Are you sure about that? Because my sound is on here. My sound is on here. Okay, so I think, all right, Priscilla said it's okay, we're good. We're good, we're good, we're good, let's go. So corporate uh, tax That's liabilities or income tax liabilities uh, for companies, very, very important uh, topic in relation uh, to that. So you comment below, I'm, I'm seeing your comments here, Priscilla Addo, um, Ebenezer Arthur, um, yes. So if you have any questions, you put it in the comment box. Now, I'm doing some giveaways and giving people opportunities to enroll uh, on, uh, on our portal and study under my mentorship for the ICA examination. So to qualify for the giveaway, you make sure you subscribe to the channel, click on the notification bell and give a thumbs up for this video and also share it as well on social media so that we'll be able to get as much people as possible to be watching and I'll be selecting or we'll be selecting some people every single day to be enrolled in a course and study under my mentorship for the ICA examination. So if it is something that I know you would want, <clears throat> I know will help you, sorry, you should uh, uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, become part of the family here. Now, so when it comes to corporate tax liabilities, this is uh, one of the critical aspects if you are writing principles of taxation or you are writing advanced taxation is one of the critical aspects. Now, you can be guaranteed that whether you like it or not, there is a 20 mark question waiting for you in the exam hall on corporate tax liabilities. Definitely, there is a 20 mark question waiting for us in the exam hall about uh, corporate tax liabilities directly on a calculation question in relation to that. So if I were you, one of the things I would do is to focus on the principles, the concepts, and the various issues that you have to understand when it comes to this very topic in relation to that. So let's get into it. 
Now, I have explained that some of the principles of chargeable income of individuals, in case you've not been able to watch that, it, is, uh, it will be in the description box and you can watch that after watching uh, this video. And I explained the principles on the computation of the chargeable income or computing the chargeable income for individuals and the various things that we have to take into consideration in dealing with the uh, first year, the second year, the relief and all of those principles, I explain them and I'll leave the playlist in the description of this video so you can watch that video as well because we are also guaranteed that there'll be a question on income tax liabilities. So definitely there'll be something on that and you want to be able to prepare, you want to be able to understand those principles in that case. Now, when it comes to taxation of companies, uh, body corporate, it, it's, it's different from dealing with individuals. Unlike individuals where we will be talking about issues in relation to uh, basic salary, allowances, bonuses, uh, we'll be talking about uh, rex allowance, vehicle allowance, accommodation allowance, and all of those things. When it comes to companies, the taxation of companies, it's different. Also, when it comes to companies, there are a couple of principles and concepts that you have to understand about what is allowable uh, deduction and non-allowable deduction, what is a taxable income and what is a non-taxable income in relation to that. So what we want to do in the stream today, especially is to look at the issue in relation to uh, the basic principles we have to understand when it comes to calculating the chargeable income of companies and ultimately, determining the corporate tax liabilities for companies. So like I said, I'll be answering your questions as well. So you make sure you comment in the chat box with any all, your, all of your questions and I'll be uh, reading them out and answering them in relation to that. So let's get into the discussion real quick. One of the things that you need to understand of the bet when we are dealing with corporate tax liabilities is to understand the basis period, uh, what is called the year of assessment. Now, for individuals, for individuals, basis period is always going to be from January to what, December at the end of the day. And we're going to look at when the person is going to, it was working. And based on that, we'll be able to determine the chargeable income of the person and thereby giving the various reliefs that has to be given, they will determine the uh, tax liabilities of the individual. But when it comes to companies, one of the things that you have to understand is that, so let me pick an annotate, let me pick something that will help me to annotate. The act provides that now, when we talk about the acts here, we are talking about the Income Tax Act 2016, Act 896. That is what we are using uh, now uh, in the main examination setting. The Act 2020 will be setting in uh, uh, later on, and there are some tweaks about it, and it will uh, come back to talk about that as well. So the act provides that the basis period will be what? The accounting year of the company or the body corporate. The basis period will be the accounting year of the company or the body of person. So if the company's accounting year ended at 31st or uh, 30th of June every year, and that becomes what the basis period. So we don't say, oh, because Ghana, Ghana, our basis year is January to December, the company too should readjust and re-prepare its financial statement into 31st December. No, the basis period or the year of assessment for a company will certainly become what the issue in relation to its accounting year. So that is off the bet. That is a starting point for our discussion in relation to that. But also you need to understand when a business ceases trading. So when a business ceases, ceases trading, uh, what do we do and how do we do the computation? Just like how we do in, for individuals, determining the income tax liabilities of individuals, when it comes to body corporate also, or companies also, the same idea is going to be happening. So if they are going to be operating and uh, they, they, they are year ended is 30th of June, so it starts 1st July every year, and they are operating and along that line or during any time in the year, the company has to cease trading, then its basis period will just be the year that they began, that is 1st July up until the month that they ended, and that will become what, the basis period for the company in relation to that. So let's pick this up and let's scroll down with a simple illustration here. So 
Jimmy Company Limited has been in business for several years, preparing accounts to 30th September each year before the act. So what is going to be happening is that they prepare accounts 30th September each year. It means that the year will start when? In October and then ends in what? 30th September. In October and ends in 30th September. In October and ends in 30th September. That is simple and that is straightforward in relation to that. Another question is here. Assuming that or assuming Jimmy Company Limited commenced business on 1st July 2017 and decided to use the 30th of September as its accounting date. However, the company prepares its first account on 30th of September 2015, a 15-month uh, period. How do we determine the basis uh, period for the year of assessment and uh, consideration? So this is where you got to be careful about how the computation is done. So we are assuming that, sorry, we are assuming that the company started on uh, 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 commence business in, uh, I think we need to skip this up, commence business on 30th, uh, 1st July 2015. And so the year ended uh, under consideration is, uh, did I say 15? No, commence business on 1st July 2017. So if it commence 1st July 2017, what do we do? So 30th of September 2017. 18 will become what the first year so as you can see or uh, being indicated there let me annotate this so you under, you know where i am at so this is it about that so that will be the first year then you see for the 2018 second year then you see for the 2019 third year in relation to that so but you got to understand what is happening in relation to the year ended of the company so for instance, they, start, they started in 1st July and they prepared their first financial statement covering a 15 month. What it means then is that we must appropriate that uh, 15 years, uh, 15 months profit between what? Two basis years. I get the idea. We must appropriate it between two basis years in relation to that. Now, in case you are asking uh, where am I, like what documents am I using? This content is coming from uh, my tax book, my advanced taxation uh, book. That is uh, what part of it that I'm sharing here in relation to that. I see a question from Uche. Uche said, bros, video for the assessment of organizational performance using the building block cannot be assessed. Has it been uploaded? Uche, I, I shared this on Facebook yesterday. On YouTube, it's not yet available on YouTube. So if you want to watch the building blog, you can go to my Facebook page, uh, Insura Premium. I shared it just yesterday, uh, uh, Fijera the Moon building blog, and you can get a video on my Facebook page uh, to watch. It's not yet uh, available on YouTube. We did it just yesterday on Facebook. It will be repurposed and recreated and brought on the, on the channel on YouTube here. But, for now, you can get it on my Facebook page, okay? So any questions you have, you know what to do, you comment below with them. So let's look at the various things that we must understand. Let's get into the principles now, and I, hope, I want you to take care and, and, and deal with this very carefully. You see, at the end of the year, when the company prepares its financial statement, you will see profit before interest and tax, they bring interest, and you see profit before tax, then you bring what? Tax, then you see profit after tax. When the tax authority comes, that profit after tax figure is not what the tax authority is going to take. So the tax authority is not going to say, okay, your profit after tax is 1000 uh, or $10,000. So, okay, your tax rate is 25%, your tax rate is 22%, your tax rate is 12.75%, your tax rate is 17.25% then it means that then, then we don't take that. So the tax authority cannot just take that with your, with your uh, income statement. Why is that? Because the income statement that we had, it's prepared using what? Accounting principles, okay? What's prepared using accounting principles and included a couple of expenses that may be allowed or that may not be allowed. So for that reason, for tax purposes, the accounting 
uh, state or the financial statement that has been prepared, that is the income statement that has been prepared, must be adjusted from accounting profit for tax profit. Because there's a difference between what the accountant will include in the financial statement to arrive at the profit after tax, and there is a difference between what the commissioner general will be allowed to be included in the financial statement to get a chargeable income for the year. So because of the discrepancy between the accounting profit and then the, the determination of the chargeable income, because we are using two different bases, because you are using IFRSs, IASs to prepare the financial statement, the income statement, but the tax authority will be looking at the act, okay, the tax laws, the tax principles. So because of that, we need to adjust the financial statement. We need to adjust the financial statement. So the big question we ask ourselves is, okay, Ishira, what are some of the reasons for adjusting the financial statement? What are some of the reasons for adjusting the financial statement? Uh, I see another comment said, um, Gambo Kanbai said, how can I assess, how can I have access to this book in Sierra Leone. Now, Gumbo, my books are all listed on Amazon. So if you're in Sierra Leone, you can uh, buy it on Amazon. You can get a Kindle version on Amazon. And then if you want the hard copy, you can still buy it on Amazon and delivery will be done uh, for you by Amazon in relation to that, okay? So uh, come, uh, Comba, sorry, Comba, come by. In case I mention your name wrong, uh, don't, don't uh, take it personal, okay? So you can get a book online. So you just go to Amazon and you can search for Ishira Premium or you can check my channel page or the description box. The link is there. It will take you straight to Amazon and you can uh, purchase this book on Amazon and, and use it in relation to that. Which just said, I think something is wrong with it on Facebook. It's not showing, sir. Okay, Uche, it should be showing uh, on my Facebook page. It should be showing. I would, I would... Uh, see and then maybe share the link with you, uh, something like that. I'll, I'll see and share the link with you, something like that. Okay, so what are the reasons? What are the reasons? Where's my case going to? Okay, so what are the reasons for the adjustment of the accounts? What are the reasons? And that's what we want to look out for. Remember, I said, um, doing some giveaways, selecting some random uh, lucky individuals who will be able to study under my mentorship and get access to our full course and study under my mentorship for their examination. So you subscribe to the channel, you give a thumbs up on this video, you share the video as well on social media, and you make sure you click on the notification bell. And I'm going to be randomly selecting some people every single day and get, give them access to free courses or the full courses on my website. And a lot, then they will be studying under my mentorship. You'll get access to me and uh, ask me questions that you have in relation to that. So you make sure you share the video on social media, subscribe to the channel, give a thumbs up on this video because that's the criteria we're gonna be using to be selecting these lucky winners every single day. So let's head back. Reasons for adjusting accounts, one, some taxpayers often suppress their income to avoid the payment of correct taxes. That's one of the reasons. So some companies will suppress their income in order to avoid what? The payment of the correct taxes. That is why we need to adjust their financial statement. For instance, they may sell goods and receive a certain amount of revenue, but they will understate their revenue. Or they will change the characteristics of a revenue Maybe instead of a capital gain uh, income, they will change it. They will do it as a revenue. Instead of a revenue, they will do it as a capital income. So for that reason, we need to what, adjust their financial statement for tax purposes in that case. Number two, some of the accounts may also contain genuine errors, such as addition mistakes, which affect net profit and hence tax payable. So there are sometimes it is not just that they have suppressed their income, but sometimes there will be some errors that they have uh, mistakes that have been committed in the financial statement. So if we readjust the financial statement in light for uh, the tax purposes, we'll be able to identify those errors and collect, uh, correct those errors in relation to that. Then three, the commissioner is required to ensure that an account submitted reflects the whole transaction of the business. 
So we want to find out whether the account submitted actually reflects what's the whole transaction of the organization, making sure that some things are not omitted from the accounts and some things that are supposed to be included are not included. And some things that are supposed to be included at say an X amount is being included at one, two X amount in the financial statement. So in order to solve that, what do we do? We need to adjust the financial statement in relation to that. Then the fourth thing about the reasons for the adjusting of the account is that the commissioner general is empowered to adjust the net profit as per the account so as to bring it in line with the tax laws. So remember what I told you, the financial statement prepared where you, we prepared them using the gap, okay? We prepared them using financial reporting standards, accounting standards, but the tax authority has to look at how much tax liabilities you're supposed to pay. What is your chargeable income? What is the corporate tax that you have to pay? So if you are filing your tax returns, it is not about what do you think you're gonna pay? It is about what the law says you have to pay. So in order for us to bring your accounts in line with the tax laws, the commissioner general require that this adjustment will be done in relation to that. But the big question we ask ourselves is, if the commissioner general is adjusting this account, is reviewing this account, is re-examining uh, uh, your account, what, what are the objectives of that? What is he looking for? Why would he want to uh, uh, examine the account and, and find out whether things are done well or things are not done well? So the next slide we want to look at is objectives of examination of accounts, the objectives of examination of accounts. Now, in examining the account of a tax uh, payer, the Commissioner General takes cognizance of the following. And these are the principles I want you to make sure you understand very well. And, and this actually cut across in all jurisdiction, actually. Most of these points cut across in all jurisdiction, irrespective of uh, where you are located. One, all disallowable expenses charged to profit or loss must be added back to the net profit. Very, very important. Now we will look at those expenses that are supposed to be disallowed as we go ahead. So one of the objectives of examining the financial statement is to ensure that all disallowable expenses which are charged to the profit or loss are added back to the profit. Now, when we say disallowable expenses, what do we mean? For instance, maybe the company engaged in something illegal and we were fined by the regulatory body or we were fined by court, or we were fined by police, we, have, we were fined by something. So we breached a law and we were fined. Now for accounting purposes, that will be an expenses, it's allowable. But in the tax uh, rule or in the tax laws, when you breach the laws and you are fined, that is not an allowable deduction. The tax authority will not say, oh, you are good, so go away with it, no. So all allowable, disallowable expenses which are charged to the statement of profit or loss, which reduces the profit of the organization is added back to the profit so that we can reflect the true nature of profit for the organization for the year under discussion. Another disallowable expenses can also be uh, um, theft or embezzlement of funds by senior executives. When senior executives take funds, take money, those kind of things may be charged as expenses. Maybe the company will write it off as expenses in the statement of profit or loss account. But when the tax authority comes, that will be disallowed and will be added back to the profit. But if it is a junior staff, then that one is allowable in relation to that. But like I said, we'll be going through some of these things uh, later on in the slide, but I want to just bring you to your knowledge about what some of these disallowable is. So, uh, so there are certain expenses, the company will include them, but the tax authority will what, disallow them. Another disallowable expenses is depreciation. You know, for accounting purposes, we're gonna be calculating what depreciation. So at the end of the year, we will compute our depreciation and we'll deduct it to be able to get a profit. When the tax authority comes, that depreciation figure will be added back to the profit and rather the tax authority gives you what is called the capital allowance in relation to that. So that is the first thing we must understand about the objective of examining the account. Two, all taxable income credits to assets or reserve accounts are added to net profit. All taxable income credits to assets or reserves accounts are added to profit. 
So there are certain incomes that a company will recognize and the company may treat it differently in the books, may not include it as part of the income in the statement of profit or loss account. Rather, we'll be uh, writing it off against reserves in the statement of financial position in relation to that in order to keep it off the income statement. So one of the objectives of examining of the account is that the tax authority will want to what? add them, those income back to the profit in relation to that. Three, all allowable expenses not charged to profit or loss is deducted from net profit. So genuinely, there are certain expenses that are allowable, like repairs and maintenance. We will get into that. When it comes to repair and maintenance, uh, um, um, repair and maintenance would have to, uh, we would have to look at the issue in relation to 5% of the written down value of the assets. And then that will be allowed, it should not be more than 5% of the written down value of the assets. If it is more than, then we only allow 5% of the written down value of the asset. The excess will be capitalized and uh, capital allowance will be uh, allowed on the asset in relation to that. So any expenses that are allowable, like capital allowance, will now be deducted from the profit of the organization. Four, all non-taxable income included in revenue are deducted from net profit. So there are sometimes the company will include some income because like for instance, let's say we are a company in Ghana and we have an investment in this uh, one district, one factory. Now the government has passed a law that all people, all investors under one district, one factory, their income dividend are exempted from tax. Now, when we receive that income for accounting purposes, we are going to be including it as part of our income in our financial statement, but it is not subject to tax. So for tax purposes, what the, the tax authority will examine your account so that it will what, take it out. If not, you'll be paying tax on an income that you are not supposed to pay tax in relation to that. I believe you are getting the principles here very well. And then the last one there is that the accounts correctly reflect the whole transaction of the business for the period in question. So one of the reasons we are uh, 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 examining the account is just to find out whether all the transactions to be included for the business for the period under consideration is actually what has been included, is actually there for the organization in relation to that. These are what we refer to as the objectives of examination of accounts. Right. So now that we have uh, dealt with the issues in relation to uh, examination of accounts, let's get deeper into some of the core principles and look at how we will treat various receipts and various expenses for when we are determining the chargeable income of the company or when we are determining the tax liabilities of a company. As always, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. If you are live, you are watching live, you have any questions, maybe it's not in relation to tax, but you have any question, you can still put it in the chat box and I'll be answering your questions for you. In that case. So let's look at the next slide and that is gonna be the tax accountancy principles, the tax accountancy uh, principles, the tax accountancy principles. Now, for the purpose of ascertaining a person's income accruing or deriving during a basis period, the timing of inclusion and deduction must be made according to generally accepted accounting uh, principles. Now, remember, as always, as a rule of thumb, uh, income that is taxable must be derived or accrued in Ghana, all right? Must be derived or accrued in Ghana in relation to that. And this applies to individuals and apply as well to applies as well to companies in relation to that. So let's start first with what we call trading receipts. Now there are various receipts or inflows that comes into a company which are going to be subject to tax. So we wanna find out what are the tax principles allow uh, around those kind of inflows, whether they are subject to tax or they are not subject to tax, whether they will be included in the determination of the chargeable income and by extension, the tax liabilities of the company or they will not be included and hence will not be part of the determination of the chargeable income and tax liabilities of the company. So the first type of receipts that we talk, we will talk about is what is referred to as trading 
receipts. Ultimately, trading receipts. So when we say trading receipts, what are trading receipts? Receipts are to be regarded as trading when they arise from operation of the business. This is very, very important. When they arise, very, very, very important. When they arise from the operations of the business, that is called trading receipts. So we are at school, students pay school fees. That is a trading receipt, okay? So once the income arise from the operations of the business, that is a trading receipt. And that is very, very important. Now, this means a receipt is a trading receipt if it is a payment for goods or services. Now, the payment made on a voluntary basis for some personal quality of taxpayer are not deemed to be trading receipts, but gift. And we'll deal with this. Uh, later on as we continue in relation to that. So I'm a school or we run a school and you enroll in our course, the money you give us is going to be trading receipt. But if you say, oh, Inshira, uh, I think your service is great. So I'm supposed to pay you $1,000, but take $200 to just buy something for yourself or buy something for your wife, that becomes what a gift. What I'm receiving, it's not because of the service I'm rendering, it's not because of my operation, but it's because of what? The quality of the services that we are rendering. And so that will be more or less like a gift rather than what? A receipt. Sorry, uh, rather than a trading receipt. But one thing you have to understand is that when it comes to dealing with receipts, we can have revenue receipts and then what? Capital receipts. In other words, we can have uh, a re revenue uh, that are received from trading purposes and revenue that are received from investment purposes in relation to that. But the receipts we are talking about here for tax purposes for corporate tax liabilities must be receipts that are revenue and not capital. Now, sometimes the distinction uh, to make, uh, to draw about uh, capital and revenue is, is, uh, is difficult sometimes, but this is what happens. The most obvious test is to determine if the assets are part of the fixed capital or part of the working capital of the business. So if the receipts that we are having forms is, is from the fixed capital of the organization, then that is a capital receipt. So like we uh, sell our assets, like we have an asset and then we sell the asset, maybe it's no more working well or it's losing its value or we've bought a new machine and we are selling that machine off, what we are having there will be what? A capital receipt in relation to that. Now that capital receipt can be taxed using capital gain tax, but now like the way the law directs, it could be included in the determination of the corporate tax liability of the company in relation to that. But if it is part of the working capital of the company, and you know working capital means day to day. So when we sell our inventories, it's an asset though, but it's a trading receipt because inventory is part of what? The day to day running of the organization. So that is the issue about receipts. Primarily the receipts must be what? Trading receipts. Then we move on to the next uh, slide. Oh, let me just get rid of this. So let's look at some other receipts uh, that we can look at when we are dealing with the receipts for organizations or companies in the determination of their income tax liabilities. So there are other receipts whose treatments require special direction in the light of the general, generally accepted principles as discussed below. So you gotta be careful about some kinds of receipts to be able to know their treatments because the fact that it's a receipt, the fact that it's a benefit that a company is receiving does not mean that it is taxable, does not mean that the company can look at it in relation to that. 
Okay, Ebenezer Atta said, please, can you go over capital receipts again? All right, so I said, the capital receipts are the receipts that we have as a result of uh, fixed capital, okay? Fixed capital. So like we are a company and we are selling part of our assets. The money, the revenue we will get, what do you call revenue? So let's say we are selling a, tri a tripod, okay? Let's say we are selling a tripod. This tripod, when we sell it, the money we get from the tripod will be referred to as what? A capital receipt. Because we don't sell tripod. What we sell is uh, education services. So that is a capital receipt. So any receipt that comes as a result of parting away with a fixed asset and not with the working capital, it's a capital receipt in relation to that. Ebenezer Atta, I hope you're okay with the principle there. Then we move on. So let's look at the uh, principles about uh, the other receipts. So the first one is compensation and damages. Now, there are some times where companies will be involved in some things and uh, there will be some compensation or some losses that a company will incur. So as a result of the loss that a company incurs, they will be compensated. So if we receive such compensation or damages, how should we treat it? How should we account for it? And this is something that you got to understand very well. Any amount of compensation or damages paid to a trader or company in consideration of the business ceasing to operate either wholly or partially is considered as a capital receipt. It's considered as a capital receipt. So compensation and damages will be considered as what? A capital receipt. So if, for instance, um, let's say we park our car, we park our car by the roadside, and what happens is that another vehicle came to uh, strip off the road and uh, and maybe, let's say, uh, collide into our car. I don't know if that's possible, but let's say collide into our car, and so our car got damaged, and we took it to the, uh, to the mechanic, and with the issue was processed to police and was taken to court and court re, uh, compensators for say $2,000. That money that we have received, we didn't sell the service, you got it? That money we have received is what? A capital receipt. It's a receipt that relates to what? The assets that has been damaged and the asset that is to be restored in relation to that. Second one, reimbursement of expenses reimbursement of expenses where an amount of compensation on damage not in itself a trading receipt include reimbursement of trading expenses allowable as a deduction for tax purposes such expenses are to be treated as damages to the extent of their reimbursement so this is also something that you have to understand about uh, the treatment in relation to that So what do we mean about, uh, about that? Okay, I think I see some comments. No, okay, so let's go. So what do we mean about that? There are some times where uh, we incur an expenses on something and we are reimbursed. Maybe the government, maybe we have a contract with the government and we undertake something or we have a contract for a client's company and we've charged them already and we are incurring an extra cost and they say they will reimburse us. So that extra cost that we've incurred and they reimbursing us, we won't say that extra money that the customer is giving us is a receipt we are having. No, that it's a receipt we are having though, but it is for the re uh, compensation or reimbursement for the expenditure we have incurred whilst working on them. So let me give you a typical example. Let's say that I'm a constructor and I'm building your house for you and I charge you $10,000. So that is a receipt, that is a trading receipt, $10,000 to build your house for you. I don't know what kind of house we will build with $10,000 though, but uh, maybe let's say some single room and, and, and something like that. So $10,000. So I'm building your house for you and I've charged you $10,000. And then let's say as I'm constructing, as we are constructing, we, we saw some things, there were land guards and everything. Then I called you and I said, boss, uh, we had a problem. The land guards came, the chief people came and you were not around and we settled all of those expenses. 
it's a damage. It's, it's an expenses that we've incurred, okay? So because of that, when you come and you now give us that money for the expenses we've incurred, it is not a receipt we are having, okay? It is treated as what? The damages to the extent of what? The reimbursement that we are having in relation to that. Next one is interest. Interest to be dealt with in the accounts of the business are to be regarded as trading receipts only when it is an essential part of the trading operations to employ capital to produce such income. That is interest on current accounts, interest on loan, interest on trade, uh, trade interest, uh, interest in the case of bank and other uh, financial concerns. So sometimes we're gonna be receiving some interest for our accounts that we have in the bank uh, for uh, interest in relation to trade uh, receivables or trade payables, all of those ones will be treated and dealt with the way they must be dealt with in relation to that. So if we borrow money, we have to pay interest on the money and that interest that we are paying or if we uh, someone buys from us on credit and the person delays in payment and we are charging interest for the delay on payment, that extra we are, amount that we are having will also be part of our receipts because it's from trading activities in relation to that. But if you will receive interest because we have depot, we have an investment in the bank, that will be treated as what? A capital receipt, because even though it's a receipt, it is not coming from our operations and our, our traditional business as an organization. Next one, rent. Rents received by a trader in respect of surplus business accommodations are included in his trading profit. Now, listen to this carefully. This, when we talk about rents here, this is what we mean. When we talk about rents here, this is what we mean. So let's say we, have, we are a business and we have a huge office place or a huge office space. So this huge office space that we have, what happened is that we are occupying maybe one third of the office. So two third of the office is lying there not doing anything there. So we now give out the two third of the office as part of what, uh, to rent it out. That is a surplus business accommodation. So that receipt that is coming in will be uh, treated or will be included in our trading profits in relation to that. Now, apart from these, all rents received from properties are normally treated as what? Investment income. So if, well, like investment property, for those of you doing FR, IS, uh, investment property is IS 40, IS 40. Then if we, are, we build the place purposely to rent it out, then that one, what we'll be receiving uh, as part of our business will be more or less like what? An investment income in relation to that. But if it is a surplus business office and we are giving out, then that receipt will be included in our trading receipt, in our trading uh, profit in that case. Next one, grants and subsidies. Grants and subsidies. Any grant or subsidies received by a taxpayer, example from the consolidated fund, and which is intended to reimburse him or a business expenses should be treated either as a trading receipt or as a reduction of the expenses which may be deducted. And I believe you know about grants IAS uh, 2020, government grants and how it is uh, treated in relation to that. So if we incur our expenses and the government is going to subsidize and the government is going to give us any grants on that, we can treat it as a what? A trading receipt. So we treat it as an income for that period in relation to that, or we will just use it to write off the expenses. So this is what it means. Let's say that we incurred a cost of say $5,000 and the government says they will reinvest us with say $3,000. What we can do is that the $5,000 expenses can be there. Then we'll recognize the $3,000 as part of our income. Or what we will do is that we will use the $3,000 that we've had to reduce the $5,000 expenses. So that now the expenses in relation to that item will only be what, 2,000 in relation to that. So the next effect is the same. Either we'll treat it as a trading receipt or we'll treat it as a reduction of the expenses which may uh, be deducted in that period in relation to that. Then the last thing there is insurance revenue on uh, uh, fixed assets. Insurance revenue on fixed assets. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Put them in the chat box, put them in the comment box. I'll be 
uh, answering all of your questions for you as you are watching me in relation to that. So insurance revenue on fixed assets, a sum received under a policy insuring a fixed asset against damages or loss is not a trading capital receipt. A sum received under a policy insuring a fixed asset against damages or loss is not a trading receipt. So I insure, I, uh, we insure our uh, vehicle and the vehicle is involved in an accident and then the insurance policy give us the sum under the insurance policy. That money they give us is not part of our trading receipt. We don't recognize as a receipt. That receipt that has come will be used to acquire what? The asset in relation to that. Now, any outlay incurred in making good uh, the damage or loss by repair or renewal or by replacement is, however, to be treated as to the extent uh, as to the extent diminished by the recovery in connection with any reduction from profit that may be due in respect of such outlay and the adjustment to be made in the case of machinery cost if the plant or machinery has been eliminated from the capital allowance comp computation by deducting its selling price in relation to that. So that is the concept about uh, uh, insurance revenue on fixed assets. So these are the six types of receipts that we can have apart from trading receipts. So let's go over that real quick. Spoke about compensation and damages, reimbursement of expenses, interest, rent, grants and subsidies, and then insurance revenue on fixed assets. Now let's look at the big question now. The big question we now ask ourselves is, all right, now we know we have an idea of the receipts that the organization can be including in arriving at its chargeable income. But the question is, what deductions are allowed and what deductions are not allowed? In other words, what are allowable deductions in corporate tax liabilities determination and what are non-allowable deductions in corporate tax liabilities determination? This is very, very important because many a times the examiner is going to give you the statement, they will give you the profit for the company, they will give you footnotes. And you have to decide whether to add back an expenses or to lessen or whatever it is that you must do in relation to that. Now, so for tax purposes, for tax purposes, an expenditure is deductible if it satisfies the three criteria we are about to go through. So an allowable expenses must meet what? One of the three criteria. Number one, it must be a revenue item. All the three criteria must be met, not one. It must be a revenue item. I've mentioned this already. So capital expenses must be capitalized and capital allowance will be computed on that. Now, capital allowance is one of the closest thing about this topic. So for those of you who have not yet watched my four part series on capital allowance, I did a four part series, very detailed on capital allowance. In case you've not watched that yet, the link is in the description box. You can watch the playlist, taxation and fiscal policy playlist, and you can watch the capital allowance there and understand how I did the various treatments, everything you need to understand about capital allowance, I did the treatment in that video. So you make sure that you watch that video in the description, I'll be leaving the link in the description. So it must be a revenue item. So if it's a capital item, it will not be allowed for deductions. Number two, number two, it must be incurred wholly, exclusively and necessarily in the production of the income. So the expenditure that we've incurred, yes, it is a revenue expenditure, but it should be wholly for the business. It should be exclusively for the business and it should be necessary for the business. Now, this wholly thing, sometimes in Ghana, it sometimes is appropriated. So for instance, let's say that the business pays for expenses for maybe uh, repairing of crack walls uh, in, our, in our office. And as we are repairing for the crack walls, the private residence of the board chairman was also repaired on. So on the two jobs, we incurred a cost of say 100,000 Ghana cities. 
Should the 100,000 Ghana cities be allowed for tax purposes or be disallowed for tax purposes? Now, if we go by the spirit of the principle of wholly, exclusively, and necessarily, the whole 100,000 should not be allowed. That is the strict law. The whole 100,000 should not be allowed. But in Ghana, sometimes it is apportioned so that the proportion that relates to the business will be allowed, and the proportion that doesn't relate to the business will be disallowed. But technically, the whole expenses is required not to be this is to be disallowed because it is not wholly for the business. And exclusively simply and necessarily simply means that it means without the expenditure, the business cannot go on. So if with the expenditure, the business can go on, without the expenditure, the business can go on, then we can deduct it. So it should be necessary for the business to go on in relation to that. Now, so I see a comment from uh, Kamba, he said, what do you mean about exclusively and necessarily? Now, necessarily, like I said, uh, uh, maybe you didn't finish listening, but necessarily, like I said, means that without the expenses, the business cannot move on, like the payment of wages and salary. It is, it is what? Necessary for the business because if we don't pay for the wages and salaries, employees will leave the business. Employees will no more what work for us in relation to that. So that should be necessary for the business. Now, exclusive, exclusively simply means that, who is, okay, I thought it's a comment. Exclusively simply means that it should be for the particular thing, for the business. Are you getting the idea? For the business in relation to that. So necessarily, it doesn't have to be uh, something that the business can be without. If it is something the business can be without, then we won't allow it. But if it is, if it is something that the business cannot be without, then it is allowable for tax purposes. So Kamba, I believe you get a concept uh, there. Then finally, it's a, it must not be specifically disallowed as a deductible expenses by statute or by law. Now, you know, by law, there are some expenses that are disallowed. Like I mentioned, personal expenses. When you're dealing with corporate tax liabilities, personal expenses are not allowed. Okay? So if there are any depreciation, are not allowed. So anything that is by law not allowed, it means we don't allow it in the computation of tax. So anything that is allowable should not be disallowed by law in relation to that. So Kamba Gambai said, thanks a lot. All right, so you are welcome. You are welcome. So these are the three criteria that must be met when we are dealing with discussing whether an expenses should be allowed or an expenses should not be allowed. So I got a bit deeper to uh, look at uh, the issues in relation to uh, wholly exclusively, but I've already mentioned that. So uh, I'm not going to go there again in that case. So let's look at some examples of deductions not allowed. I have already given you some of them, but let's look at some of them. The act, please, does paying the hospital bills of staff, children, qualify under this rule? Okay, so Miles, Miles did said, please, does paying the hospital bills of staff, children, qualify under this rule? Now, if this policy applies to all employees, then it's an allowable deduction. I like this question, Miles. It's an excellent question in taxation that tricked a lot of students. So I like that question. That's an excellent question. If the policy is available to all employees, then it will be allowable for tax purposes. Okay, in Ghana, I, I don't know for other countries, though. I don't know for other countries, but in Ghana, that is it. But like I said, some of these principles cut across. So if the policy is exclusive, it's available to all employees, then it will be allowable. But if the policy of paying uh, hospital bills of staff of children is allowable for only some senior executives or some selected employees of the organization, then that expenses will be disallowed by the tax authority. Why? Because it is not necessary, because it is not exclusive. Are you getting the concept? Because it's not wholly of the business. So Miles, that is the, the extension there in relation to that. If it is a general policy, it's allowable. If it is not a general policy, it is disallowed. 
Then we come to the uh, uh, deductions not allowed. Now, so the Act provides a list of five deductions uh, that are not allowed, and I've already mentioned some of these things uh, to you guys in relation to that. A, any domestic or private outgoing expenses, and we've mentioned this, so any domestic or private outgoing expenses will be disallowed. So like I said, we are repairing our office and then we are repairing the private residence for the board chairman. That's a private, that's a domestic expenses. It will be disallowed for tax purposes. Two, any outgoing expenses of a capital nature, we've also mentioned this, uh, the uh, expenses allowable must be a revenue nature. So if it's a capital nature, then it has to be capitalized and then capital allowance will be uh, taken for it in relation to that. All right, so Miles, Miles said, thanks a lot. You are welcome, Miles. If there are any other questions in the chat box. Number three, any outgoing or expenses that is recoverable under any insurance or contract of indemnity. So when we pay any expenses and it is recoverable under insurance, then it is disallowed. So this is where the company is paying insurance premium or something because we will be recovering that under the insurance policy or we'll be indemnified uh, about it later on. It will be disallowed for tax purposes. Then any income tax, profits tax or similar tax that has been paid during the year. This is very, very important. When we are determining the taxable or the chargeable income of a company so that we can determine the tax that is payable, any income tax they've paid during the year has to be added back to their profit because it will be disallowed. Because we are yet to get their chargeable income, then we will do the tax rate on the chargeable income, either 25%, 22%, 15%, uh, uh, 18 18.75, 25%, 12.75%, 12 whatever rate it is, we are yet to calculate the chargeable income. So any income tax that they have paid during the year is added back to their profit. And after we calculate their chargeable income and determine their tax liability, we will deduct the tax that they have paid already then we will now get the amount of tax that is outstanding for the year under consideration in relation to that. Gomba said, I had wanted to ask the same question. Thanks, Miles, for your excellent question. Okay, so uh, Gomba said uh, he wanted to ask the same question. So uh, you were all flowing on that line. So any tax that has been paid during the year, we will add it back to the profit of the organization and boom, Certainly, we will be deducting it. Then certainly, depreciation in relation to that. Depreciation in relation to that. But when we talk about domestic and private outgoing expenses, what do we mean? So there are some examples that I have here in relation to what domestic or private outgoing expenses actually means. So when we say domestic or private outgoing expenses, what do we mean or what are we talking about? Number one, traveling between a person's home and the place of work. So expenses you incur from home to your place of work may not be allowed for tax purposes. But there is a debate about this. There is a debate about this because there are some people like doctors, they said that, hey, they start working from their home before they get to their office. Because sometimes on, from home, a nurse will call them and with the usage of technology, they are working from home uh, uh, and on their way down to their office. So as far as they have started working from home, it means that the expenses they incur from home to the office should be allowed for tax purposes. So there is actually a debate around this, whether it will be allowable or it will be disallowable. But depending on the conditions, sometimes it will be disallowed and sometimes it, will, it may also be allowed in relation to that. Then maintenance of that person's home or his family. So any private maintenance of the person, so that is why I said the private residence of the board chairman that the company is incurring cost on will be disallowed for tax purposes. Okay, that's there. Three, expenses in acquiring clothing, one to work other than clothing that is not suitable for wearing outside of work. Okay, so expenses in acquiring clothing, one to work other than that is not suitable for wearing outside of work. That may be also referred to as 
domestic expenses. And then in the education of that person, not directly relevant to the person's business and education leading to a degree. So sometimes the company can say, oh, they are giving scholarship to their employees to go and learn. Now, if uh, uh, we are training people and the skill they are getting is not directly related to our business, directly related to what the person is doing, then that expenses may be disallowed for tax purposes in relation to that. So these are the things you have to understand in relation to dealing with uh, allowable expenses in that case. Any questions for me, please comment below with any questions you have. My device is going low. Let me check and plug this real quick. So you comment below with any questions for me. All right, so we good. Now, so I'm gonna be concluding somewhere around here today and God willing tomorrow, we are going to be continuing with dealing with allowable and non-allowable deductions and uh, deal with the principles very, very well in relation to that, uh, God willing tomorrow, bad debts and the deduction principles, then we'll start with some principles in relation to that. So I'm gonna be con uh, concluding here today for uh, the uh, day's discussion uh, because I have another broadcast at 6 p.m. on Facebook. So in the next few minutes, I'll be live on Facebook. And on Facebook today, I'll be looking at withholding tax. Okay, withholding tax. So I'll be discussing withholding tax today on Facebook at like 6 p.m., uh, more or less like 15 minutes from now. Okay, 15 minutes from now. So remember what I said, I'm doing some giveaways every single day. So every day I'm selecting some people who will be enrolled in the full course online and be able to study under my mentorship. All you have to do is you subscribe to the channel, you click on the notification bell, you make sure it gives a thumbs up to this video, meaning you like this video and you share it as well on social media. Every single day, we're gonna be selecting someone who will be enrolling in the full course, get access to my eBooks and study under my mentorship for you to prepare for your examination and pass your examination. The reason why we are doing this is to be able to grow our community and get more people into this, but most importantly, to also provide you with the assistance that you need on that personal level as you become a fan of my work and you become part of the family in relation to that. So that is where we're gonna be uh, concluding here today for our uh, discussion. And thank you very much for joining the stream. Uh, Uche, Ijehu, um, all of you guys, uh, Uche, Ijehu, Ebenezer, Ata, Prisla, Ado, Adriamoa Ado, um, who else? Kumba, uh, Dambai, um, and then Miles, Miles. All of you guys, thank you very much for uh, taking time to join the stream today. Make sure you join me same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. or 16.30 GMT uh, tomorrow. And we're gonna be continuing with the part two of this as we explain the principles and the concepts in corporate tax liability. This is part of the series on taxation lectures that I'll be doing in order for you to prepare well for your examination. So connect with me as well on Facebook and make sure that you like my Facebook page. I'll be live on Facebook in the next few minutes and we will be looking at uh, withholding tax and discussing the issue about withholding tax and how companies can uh, use that and individuals can also rely on that in order for us to determine the tax liabilities of individuals and also of companies. So thank you very much. You take care of yourself. And most importantly, remember that coronavirus is still here. Ghana, we now have over 3,000, I think close to 3,100 cases uh, as at, uh, now that I'm uh, recording this video here. And so you make sure that you take care of yourself. You sanitize your hand uh, regularly. You use the various directive that has been uh, set, the various social distancing issues, and you will be able to get better and take your life to the next level. So thank you very much for joining the stream and I'll see you same time tomorrow.
as we continue with our discussion. Bye-bye.